Senior Vice President and hold the Simon Chair in Political Economy here at CSAS. Delighted to welcome all of you here in the audience and online. We always have a good viewership online. Delighted to have you with us as well uh, for this event on research collaboration. Um, and um, we have a, just a terrific uh, group of uh, speakers that I'm going to introduce in a, in a minute. Uh, but uh, let me first do a couple of administrative announcements. As always, please silence any uh, noisemakers. Uh, we, if we have any kind of incident, a fire or something, uh, please follow me. There, there's an emergency exit back through here or over there. There's a staircase down to the alley, and we rally at National Geographic a block behind here, or if appropriate, go out the front uh, side and down the stairs there. Um, and I think uh, I also want to thank very much uh, the uh, allied uh, countries and partners who made this uh, event possible. We uh, couldn't do what we do without the support of our sponsors, and we very much appreciate all of your support. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, one of America's greatest strengths is our best in the world universities uh, and the incredible research talent that it attracts. Uh, the, the world's brightest minds want to study and research in the United States, uh, which helps maintain our status as a global innovation leader. Since the Cold War, uh, there's been a robust policy debate in Washington about whether to control foreign research collaboration, visas for foreign students, and the flow of scientific information to address potential national security risks. So this is not a new issue. This debate has heated up over the last two years, though, as competition with China intensifies. In the last year, several individual US government agencies have increased scrutiny of foreign researchers. Members of Congress have introduced legislation that would tighten restrictions on foreign research collaboration. At the same time, there's a growing chorus of concern regarding the potential downsides of such restrictions on US domestic scientific development. Uh, some 79% of computer science graduates, for example, uh, in the U.S. are foreigners, so um, restrictions on them have implications. Policymakers are cognizant of these risks and are debating how to balance uh, these tensions and how to balance uh, the need to protect national security um, while preserving the open research environment that is uh, such a core strength of the United States. So we're pleased uh, to be able to contribute to this debate today. Uh, by having this uh, event on, on research collaboration um, and through related work that we do in the Simon Chair and in other programs here at CSAS, because there are a lot of us that are in one way or another uh, dealing with this uh, set of issues. Um, and um, we have a terrific speaker to kick off uh, this uh, discussion today. Um, and that is uh, Norman Augustine, Dr. Norman Augustine, who's going to come up in a second to enlighten us on uh, his perspective on these issues. Um, Dr. Augustine, you have his bio in your uh, packet, and so I won't repeat because it would be uh, too um, lengthy to repeat all of his distinguished service in government, in the private sector, in academia. Um, his name Augustine evokes sort of the late Roman or early Dark Ages, um, but he is truly a Renaissance man, uh, if you read his bio. Um, and um, he has uh, really a unique perspective on all of these issues. Uh, as he said in a TED talk that we watched in preparing uh, for this event, um, he uh, has a, a bachelor's and master's degrees in aeronautical engineering. Uh, and so he really is a rocket scientist. So uh, we are we're very fortunate to have Norm Augustine with us. And so Norm, if you could come up and, and uh, enlighten us, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Please join me in welcoming him. Well, Matt, thank you very much. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, that was a very kind introduction. It was, it was so generous that for a moment there, I was reminded uh, when my first day on the faculty at Princeton, after having spent my entire career up until that time, either in government or industry, and I was asked to uh, make the opening lecture to the incoming freshman engineers. And I, the dean was making his introductory remarks. I wouldn't pay much attention to what he was saying. I was slipping through my notes. And all of a sudden, I heard him say, uh, and now we will hear from Professor Augustine. And this is absolutely true for just an instant, the thought through what went through my mind. Gee, what a coincidence. They've got some guy here by the same name as me. 
And in any event, it's awfully good to be here. And I think that there are very few issues, at least in my opinion, that have as many conflicting arguments and ramifications at almost every level as does the issue of uh, research collaboration uh, with China or relationships with China, the commercial sphere for that matter. Uh, questions range all the way from uh, IT theft to uh, talent recruitment to uh, subsidizing uh, our research projects and, and, and more. And given the contentiousness and the complexity of the topic, uh, I was going to say that it wouldn't be unreasonable for you to be asking uh, what I might add, uh, but I was going to point out that I am a rocket scientist, but since you pointed that out for me, I won't have to. My first trip to China was in 1978 as part of a very small delegation that had been invited to visit the Chinese government's aerospace enter enterprise. It was then known, as I recall, as uh, the eighth machine building industry. Uh, that wasn't long after President Nixon's famous visit to China, and it was very shortly after the Russians had abandoned China and left them, particularly the science and engineering, in a lurch. In our travels throughout a considerable part of China, I recall seeing just one adult that was not in a Mao suit. I recall seeing very few automobiles, and those that I saw were all government cars. Uh, bicycles were the vogue. Uh, there were large and curious crowds. By large, I mean up to two, three hundred people would follow us down the street. Uh, and, and at that time, uh, English lessons were being given on loudspeakers in the buses, uh, the public buses in China, uh, since Russian was now no longer uh, the language, of, foreign language of preference. Uh, the technical laboratories we visited were generally fairly primitive. Uh, the industrial facilities even more so. Uh, the research labs that we visited uh, where they were doing theoretical work in the universities, however, was superb, truly world class. And in my return visits to China over the years, I've been utterly stunned by the economic progress that's been made. China now has a larger middle class than the population of the entire United States. Five years ago, uh, it passed the U.S. in GDP as measured in uh, purchasing power parity, which my economist friends uh, tell me is, is a very meaningful basis. We don't often hear that. And since my first visit to China, GDP per capita has gone, grown by almost a factor of 50 there. And one can ask how has this extraordinarily feat uh, been accomplished and the major factor in that has been China's almost singular focus on technology and science and setting specific goals to meet along the way. Uh, some of these goals were included in plans such as the Made in China 2025 plan, China's 13th five-year plan that specifies 16 uh, specific mega projects that are intended to pro generate leadership in those areas by 2030 or the plan to surpass U.S. military capability by 2050, if not before. China is, of course, though, uh, anything but a model of governance with its suppression of large groups, uh, environmental destructiveness, piracy of intellectual property, tilted commercial conditions, and habitual uh, tendency to fail to keep promises that were made to other nations, particularly in the economic realm. But China's understanding of the role of research and technology is not to be questioned. To quote Wen Jiabao, the former premier of the State Council of the People's Republic of China, and I quote, the history of modernization is in essence a history of scientific and technological progress. Scientific discovery and technological innovations have brought about new civilizations, modern industries, and the rise and fall of nations. I firmly believe that science is the ultimate revolution." End of quote. And taking just a moment to share with you a personal experience uh, in this regard some years ago, uh, I had the occasion to meet in Beijing uh, at that time on a business matter with the President of the People's Republic of China. And in our visit, uh, when he discovered that I was an engineer, as was he, uh, he had no interest in discussing the business issues we were dealing with anymore, 
All he wanted to talk about was engineering education. And uh, he, uh, of course, was an engineer like uh, President Xi Jinping and his predecessor, Hu Jintao, uh, both graduates of Tsinghua University, uh, which has sometimes been referred to as the MIT of China. About 80% of the government leaders at all levels in China are said to be, uh, have degrees in either science or engineering. In contrast, uh, following the most recent US election, uh, the number of scientists and engineers in the 435 member US Congress just ballooned to 11. The point is that the importance of leadership and research, which is the foundation of engineering and the foundation of most innovation these days, uh, is unlikely to be lost on the leadership in China, but on it, particularly in its decision-making process, if process is the proper term. This importance has been pointed out in the United States uh, for a number of years as well, this importance of science and technology. Uh, one study that formed the basis of a Nobel Prize in the 1980s concluded that as much of, as 85% of the growth in America's GDP during the prior 50 years had been attributable to just two closely related fields, science and technology. And it's likely that that's even more the case in the world we live in today. And it is, of course, America's GDP that underpins everything from our health care to social security, from uh, education to research, from infrastructure to a large part of the quality of life of our citizenry. And not to be overlooked, uh, not long ago, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during congressional testimony pointed out uh, the importance to national security of GDP growth. And in addition, uh, almost every Secretary of Defense in memory has said that America's technological edge in military affairs is a key element in its ability of the military to prevail in combat. All this raises an existential question, and that is, when do you last recall the subject of science and technology being discussed at any political meeting, any uh, uh, presidential debate, uh, any campaign speech, or any other sort of venue like that? Uh, the possible exceptions would be uh, questions of the veracity of environmental sciences and uh, the safety of measles vaccines. But other than that, uh, you just don't hear discussion in the political arena uh, of these topics. How many Americans are aware that uh, this year, for the first time, uh, about as we meet here, China's passing the United States in its investment in research and development, uh, again in purchasing power parity? As a person who spent uh, uh, 10 years in six different positions in our government, federal government, uh, am I arguing for the government to uh, centralize research planning or to pick winners and losers? And the clear answer to that is a resounding no. However, uh, some uh, degree of coordination within our country of such an important field does seem to be in order. And one does have to admit that organizations like NIH and NSF and NQTEL and DARPA and the Office of Science and the Department of Energy and ARPA-E and so on do pick winners every day when they award contracts and grants. And once again, in my opinion, they do a very good job of it. And one of the reasons they do a good job is that they routinely seek independent input uh, as to uh, from people knowledgeable in the field that's being addressed and uh, they also seek input from those who will have to uh, implement the results of whatever research uh, is conducted. In academia, the former is called uh, peer review. And research does matter. Yet within our country, uh, policy making in the research arena has largely been a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma, as Churchill might have put it. Uh, perhaps the most enigmatic issue of all uh, is that of balancing the immense benefit of openness in the conduct of research with the undesirable impacts of some aspects of openness when it comes to national security. 
The conduct of scientific research is somewhat analogous to assembling a large jigsaw puzzle where no one person owns all the pieces. Uh, science is clearly at its best when it's borderless. But how do you produce, preserve uh, borderlessness and openness when some of those with whom you share your knowledge and the help you create that knowledge jointly are national security competitors? As a, as, and commercial competitors, I might add. Uh, as a personal example of such a dilemma that's on a far smaller scale and easier to deal with, but nonetheless teaches some lessons. Uh, when I had the privilege of uh, leading the Lockheed Martin Company, ironically, our largest subcontractor, subcontractor partner, also happened to be uh, our uh, largest competitor, Boeing. How do we make this work? Well, there were probably three primary ingredients in the answer. One had to do with disclosure, so that everyone knew where the other stood, or at least where they claimed to stay, knowing the latter is important too. Uh, the second was a clear set of rules of the road. And the third was a clear understanding that there was a downside for violating the rules of the road. And uh, namely, that was being shunned from future business opportunities together as well as potentially the opportunity to work with others. And the importance of clarity in this process uh, I don't think can be overstated. Too often governments, uh, and ours prominently included, rather than erecting highway signs that say speed limit 65 miles an hour, put up signs that say no speeding. This poses a real problem to the driver. Further, uh, the problem exists when different government agencies put up different speed limit signs on the same segment of the road. That too poses a problem. And further complicating matters in the case of governments as opposed to companies, governments uh, operate, in, operate within autonomously established rules uh, of the road that can be unilaterally changed at any time without notice. And the effectiveness of the international legal system to resolve the resulting disputes also has opportunity for a great deal of improvement. Several years ago, uh, Bob Gates and I were asked to co-chair for the Department of Commerce a committee on deemed exports, an issue that at the time had many academics very concerned that in their teaching or research they might inadvertently, inadvertently violate the deemed exports rules. Such was the complexity and the uncertainty involved that rather than referring to our little group that had been established by its formal name, which was the Committee on Deemed Exports, I always referred to us as the Committee of Doomed Experts. <laughs> Throughout much of history, research has been a collaborative endeavor, particularly in the case of so-called basic or fundamental research. I'll come back to those definitions. And progress was shared through open publication uh, in peer-reviewed journals uh, available throughout the world and at international symposia. And indeed, the motto of academia has been said to be uh, publish or perish. And uh, in the sense of balance, I should probably point out that in industry, uh, if one were to have such a motto, it would probably read publish and perish. But there may be a grain of, in, grain of insight contained in this conundrum, and namely, uh, it is that fundamental knowledge needs to be treated differently from the efforts to apply that fundamental knowledge to a specific application, a specific product or capability. And nowhere is this dilemma more prevalent or more profound than in the national security area. For example, during World War II, should the fundamental research on uh, the physics aimed at producing an atomic bomb have been openly published? Or should current research in healthcare that uh, may provide a pathway to readily made biological weapons be openly published? Uh, most people would probably say no to both questions, but where is the line to be drawn compared with, for example, research on black holes or on high energy particles? that seem rather benign in terms of national security implications. Clearly not all research is equal in terms of positive or negative practical applications and impacts. For that reason, I believe that 
we should categorize research in three, not the conventional two areas. In my thinking, the first area would be curiosity-driven research, purely curiosity-driven, uh, such as uh, studying uh, black holes. The second would be uh, uh, basic research, uh, such as studying the human genome, but that was being conducted with a specific objective of finding a cure to, say, cancer. And the third group would be applied research, taking existing knowledge and applying it to uh, a specific end. And that's a definition that's fairly conventional today. Uh, the openness of research debate assumes particular importance in today's still evolving uh, global scientific enterprise, wherein one, no one nation, uh, increasingly including the United States, uh, no one nation has a monopoly on scientific advancements. And of perhaps near equal importance in the commercial sphere, not all nations are alike in terms of their ability to quickly apply uh, technological scientific breakthroughs into the marketplace or the military sphere. The research that uh, led to the discovery of the Higgs boson in CERN in France and Switzerland is a canonical example of the importance and the impact of cross-border cooperation. It involves scientists from literally dozens of countries. Another such example is the ongoing international research uh, to better understand the behavior of neutrinos. But making matters still more intractable from a national security standpoint is the shift uh, that has taken place since the World War II area, or perhaps two shifts. Uh, the first of these would be when the leading edge of, during World War II, most of the leading edge of scientific work uh, was to be found in national security laboratories, and that was true during most of the Cold War. But uh, today, in contrast, most of the leading edge of scientific research and technology is to be found in the commercial sphere. Also during the Cold War, uh, the Soviets and Americans were acknowledged uh, enemies, and ironically, uh, had little reason to have to deal with the issue we're talking about today, because there was very little interchange in either science or uh, commerce. Further uh, research results uh, in either the commercial or uh, uh, technical, the commercial or military sphere uh, often have dual uses, both positive and negative. And that's not a new phenomenon. If you think about it, the uh, ancient discovery of fire opened the possibility of keeping one's shelter warm, but it also opened the possibility of burning down your enemy's shelter. A related issue might be categorized as a subset of deemed exports. And this concerns the extremely practi uh, valuable practice of exchanging knowledge, especially results in basic research with one's allies. And this includes working in concert with one another on research. And this certainly clearly seems to be a case of one plus one equals three, or where the sum is greater, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. But what of the circumstance where one's allies have more lenient policies for the control of information than you do, the nation producing the information in this case? How does one deal with that? Is the answer to terminate uh, all scientific uh, relationships with one's allies? Uh, I think not. Uh, I think that uh, Although there is an argument here that the chain is only as strong as the weakest link, I think one has to be very careful to narrow as much as possible those areas where one can't work with one's allies or one's uh, acknowledged competitors uh, and not have broad uh, pr restrictive provisions. In practicality, governments cannot indefinitely protect scientific knowledge and certainly not democratic governments. Others will eventually discover the knowledge in their own or will gradually seep through whatever protective barriers have been established. Choices have to be made as to which relatively few technology and scientific topics need to be protected in a special way. And that is, again, to narrow the, the span of research areas of interest. And were I to have to make such a choice today, uh, I would probably include uh, quantum physics as it applies to telecommunications and computers. 
uh, some aspects of artificial intelligence and some elements of genomics and biochemistry, uh, highly advanced integrated circuits, and perhaps even uh, facets of automation. And that's just my list. And you will note that I included an awful lot of sums and maybes in my uh, definitions. Science does have a way of surprising us in terms of the future outcomes. Uh, the great way to embarrass yourself is to try to project future scientific advancements. Uh, many of them occur almost without predictability. Sir, Isaac, uh, Sir Alexander Fleming was not seeking to discover a new antibiotic uh, when he discovered the clue to making penicillin, and Rentgen was not trying to come up with the idea for an x-ray machine, or even x-rays, when he was investigating the flow of electrons through uh, plasmas. And research on the chemistry of butterfly wings was not expected to produce an ingredient used in the treatment of cancer. The study of interaction of radio waves with the stratosphere was not supposed to lead to radar nor was the initial investigation of coronet light waves supposed to produce lasers or beam weapons, I might add. The complexity of so many of today's critical systems is so great that uh, that includes the facility of modern research, that includes modern research facilities, uh, that it's very difficult to define what state those systems may one day find themselves or even uh, uh, what impact they might be able to have. Uh, that's particularly true of modern systems that may contain hundreds of thousands of lines of code, software code. And uh, you may recall from another occasion some years ago when a tree branch in Ohio combined with a faulty line of software code in the United States electrical system and put the northeastern United States and part of Canada in the dark for several days. And certainly no nation in the modern era of science and technology can be an island unto itself, hoping to remain isolated from the community writ large, and at the same time maintain a prolific scientific enterprise uh, and all the benefits that that enterprise will offer to the citizenry. Nations uh, prosper in science by working with their allies in pursuit of fundamental knowledge and sometimes even with those who are not their acknowledged allies. This notion is at the very center of the growing attention that's being focused now on our nation's research universities that conduct the lion's share of America's basic research and, our, and fundamental research and are almost uh, by any measure one of our greatest competitive advantages. Our universities today uh, involve Chinese national researchers and a non-trivial part of the scientific research is performed by them. Before delving further into potential constraints, uh, a dose of reality is probably in order. Over 50% of America's current engineering, fa 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 engineering uh, f faculty, and I'm an engineer, uh, were foreign born, many of whom are Chinese. So too is about 30% of America's overall science and technology workforce uh, foreign born. Over half the doctoral degrees awarded in engineering now by US universities are being earned by non-US citizens. And in the most recent decade, students from China received 43,000 PhD degrees from US universities. And they were not studying poetry by and large. Worthy of note, China itself now awards one and a half million bachelor's degrees in science and engineering as compared with 377,000 awarded in the U.S., uh, many of the latter to foreign nationals. And when these foreign nationals have completed their education in the U.S., over time, nearly two-thirds stayed here to contribute to the U.S. economy, national security, and way of life. Uh, disproportionately creating new companies and disproportionately winning Nobel Prizes. Uh, it would seem to be unwise for our immigration laws to drive these people away when they have just completed the major investment made in them by our universities, drive them away so they can compete against us. So, is this a case, of, in the words attributed to former Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, 
a case of the capitalists will sell you the rope to hang them by, or is it a case of self-interest accompanied by some risk? There can be no question that China has habitually stolen intellectual property, is seeking to globally dominate infrastructure such as telecommunications and ultra-high-speed communication, uh, has spies and, yes, embedded in its student population, and enforces non-reciprocal uh, trade access conditions. But is it a better solution to seek to isolate ourselves from China or to seek to work through them where we can but to realize that in so doing must be very deliberate precautionary steps to protect ourselves. I tend to favor the latter, believing the better solution to a few bad apples is not to cut down the apple tree. The fact is that America's research and engineering enterprise today could not function were it not for the contributions of foreign-born individuals who came here to study and remained here to contribute to society. This is something to which our nation should be greatly indebted. Many of these individuals have come from China. But whatever the case, we shouldn't be ambivalent or dilatory. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately as the case may be in democracies, the accelerating pace of science and technology far outpaces the, the pace of policy making. The former CEO of Intel, tells that 90% of the revenues that that firm receives on the last day of any year come from products that didn't exist on the first day of that year. It took over 70 years for the telephone to become present and for, go from 10% of American homes to 90% of American homes. Uh, the smartphone did that in eight years. And finally, I can't leave this topic without raising the question of why does America not produce more scientists and engineers of its own from native-born citizens, such that it, perhaps it isn't so dependent upon others? In the case of my field, engineering, 33% of baccalaureate-level degrees in China are awarded in the field of engineering. In Europe, it's 15%. In the U.S., it just rose to 6%. The United States uh, recently advanced to 69th in the world in terms of the fraction of degree, baccalaureate degrees awarded that are awarded in the field of engineering, uh, right behind Cambodia. Uh, in the prior survey, uh, we were 79th, just behind Mozambique, so we're moving up. And there are many reasons for this uh, situation to stand out, neither of which are the fault of China or anyone else other than ourselves. The first is that about 38% of America's graduating physical scientists and 22% of the engineers are women. Minority groups are absent to an even greater extent. This underrepresentation of such groups uh, represents an enormous loss to our talent base in science and engineering. The second reason I'd cite would our company's overall failing primary and secondary public school system, particularly in the critical fields of mathematics and science. And the most recent test, uh, international test of 15-year-olds, the U.S. ranked 21st in science, 27th in math out of 32 developed nations. It might be well to devote more attention to why America produces so few scientists and engineers from its own citizenry as we build uh, uh, barriers uh, to that the enter, entrance to that field. By far the best way to prosper in a world by science and technology is to get out and compete. That's the only way that the nation really can have a chance to remain at the forefront of scientific advancement. Uh, yet constraints will have to be imposed, but they should be as narrow as possible, both in terms of subject matter and performer. This unfortunately will require consideration based on a case-by-case -case particular circumstance base. All of which brings me back to where I began, uh, the need to disclose potential conflicts of interest, to establish clear rules of the road, and to impose penalties for those who would not play by the rules of the road that were agreed upon. The constraints should be narrow, and uh, they should be backed by a commitment to compete at the leading edge of science, both by investing in science and in the education of those who would perform science. Now, having said that, uh, we're going to have a panel that's going to tell us exactly how to do all that. Thank you very much.
stay here. Okay. Um, originally, we were going to have a, a conversation, but I realize that that's going to take advantage of you because your questions are really important, and I want to hear from you. So, what we're going to do instead is, if you're if you're sure. willing, Norm, to take a couple of questions, we'll do that before the panel comes up here. Um, I have one if there's nobody uh, brave enough to, to, to volunteer, but here we go. There's somebody in the front row and there's a lady in the second row. Um, and there's a microphone. Just identify yourself, if you would, please. Yes, uh, Frank Fletcher with Daniel Morgan Graduate School. Uh, Mr. Augustine, um, who is leading the world in terms of significant progress with respect to nuclear fusion, and how close are we to... In that, That's in a that great field. question. Uh, the, uh, when I was at graduate school long, long ago at, at Princeton, they had a Project Matterhorn that was uh, doing nuclear fusion. And I asked the researchers there how long it would be before we had commercial electricity on the grid from nuclear fusion. And the answer was 30 years. Uh, about two years ago, I was at uh, the, the uh, uh, no oh, goodness, a little laboratory in Chicago that DOE runs. And I asked the researchers there, how long will it be before we have commercial electricity on the grid for nuclear fusion? And they told me 30 years. And so I was reassured we haven't lost any ground. And, <laughs> but uh, just a few weeks ago, I was at MIT where there were some experts in the field, of which I'm not one. And I really pinned them down, I think, uh, to give me the under over by what date will we have nuclear fusion and derived electricity on the grid. And uh, the, the median under over number was 2032, which was a lot sooner than I would have thought. But these were the experts. So it's probably more a matter of politics and economics than technology, which is tough enough. Right, right in the second row here. Can we bring a microphone? Thanks. Thank you, I'm Paula Stern. And we've met uh, when uh, I came to v visit with you on behalf of the National Center for Women and Information Technology um, after you had done the rising above the uh, storm, the gathering storm. Uh, and I'm so happy and I thank you for mentioning this disparity that we have in our own population um, that would be feeding uh, our future in computing and information technology, and that is women and underrepresented minorities, um, because the problems really are homemade and homegrown. And um, I guess my question to you would be, what do you, since we've been working at this since the National Science Foundation got us going about 14 years ago, what would you be telling the National Center for Women and in Information Technology about how to accelerate both corporations, corp in particular defense contractors, uh, in, in working to, it, it, to integrate and advance and uh, retain women once they are, have attained uh, the, the knowledge and skills that are necessary. Paula, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I should point out that the person who's now CEO of the company I used to run is a woman, and she, everyone says she's doing a lot better job than the guy before her, but uh, <laughs> that's the one hazard. Uh, the, the, the point you make uh, in, in my field engineering, it's, the specific number is 22% of the uh, graduates uh, are, are, are women. And uh, that's just not a formula for success. And you say, why, why is it so low? 58% of college graduates in our women, almost half as many more than men. Uh, the, uh, uh, the valedictorians in high schools are now 72% women. And so this is an issue that, in many senses, far transcends the issue that we're here to discuss, because you just can't ignore the, the, the potential source there. What do you do about it? One thing is you get fathers not to tell their daughters that girls don't do math. Uh, another thing that uh, I think uh, we do is we've got to gradually get more women in leadership positions in universities. And, uh, the, the other thing is just in general, fix the quality of math education and science education in our public schools, which is a, a, a terrible drag today. Overall, I don't mean to imply for a moment that that's true in every school. Okay, maybe one from this area. There was, I thought I saw a hand back here, but maybe not. Okay, lost your chance. All right, and there, and then, and then I think we'll call it 
Go ahead, sir, do the panel. Uh, I'm Dave Crandall, recent, uh, retired six or seven years ago from the Department of Energy, National Nuclear Security Administration. I returned from China last night where I was at a conference called International Conference on Radi Matter and Radiation at Extremes, sponsored by the nuclear weapons people in China. <laughs> so we're living this boundary real intensely right now in that whole subject matter of what I call high energy density science, which includes inertial confinement fusion. Uh, so I'm experiencing it right now. And I'm, I'm really curious about how we can define the boundary to be useful between pure research and applied research. And, and as an example, you commented on black holes. Well, if you want to start a nuclear weapons program, the first place you should go to get talent is astrophysics, because it's the same skills. <laughs> so it's a very delicate problem. Uh, we tend to think in terms of publishable research versus not publishable research, and the science community does. And trying to make that definition clear, I think, would be very helpful. I don't, I'm happy to have a comment on that. I, I think that the most important thing that's happened to the U.S., giving us economic strength and military prowess, has been the import of foreign scientists through our research universities. And I'd be happy for a comment on that. Uh, and how do we, I, I really think we're a little too far over on the security side at the moment. M most Americans did not attend this conference that I went to, uh, but the Japanese and the Europeans were there in spades. Uh, it's a tough problem, we look for help, but I think this publishable versus not publishable is a, in, what everybody understands, but we don't refine well enough. Well, you make a lot of important points, and uh, I wish there were time to comment on all, but uh, once again, I think that uh, you put your finger on it. There, There's a set of things that most likely don't have a military or commercial application when you're talking about truly fundamental research. Uh, then there's that body of things that clearly do. And you put your finger on the middle. Uh, how do you define that? And particularly when there's this uncertainty of the outcomes of science. And that's where you need uh, people who are knowledgeable and can exercise judgment. And my hope is that our policy can narrow that uncertain regime as much as possible. And I do think that can be done. And uh, I think you express your view that maybe we've moved a little too far in security. Uh, that, I suspect uh, that's a view held by some, but uh, many others, I think, would say that uh, we're at least in danger of uh, constraining our great scientific community. And I worry a lot about that. So, well, thank you again well, for inviting me. Well, thank me. you. Uh, my, my brother, my older brother, who I think is watching, is an astrophysicist at Princeton, and I think he's only working on black holes, but I'm not entirely sure because <laughs> I don't understand what he does, but um, uh, because I'm not a rocket scientist. But before we, uh, I ask you to join me in thanking Norm. Uh, let me just say that don't go anywhere. We're going to be just switching the stage configuration here and moving straight into the panel. My colleague Stephanie Siegel will uh, moderate the panel. But uh, now, if you would join me in thanking Norm for a terrific work. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much.
on this topic because there's clearly a lot of interest and it's clearly a, an important one for issues both of national security, also of economic competitiveness, and for uh, relationships with allies and partners. So for all those reasons, I'm very happy to see, um, see this crowd here. And if I could just add my thanks uh, to Norm Augustine for speaking at this event. I have to say, when we came across this issue and really started digging into it, we could not have asked for someone with the background and perspective. We have another uh, expert here at CSIS who always introduces his panelists as a great American. And I think, in this case, we can say <laughs> thank you very much for the contribution here today. So we have the benefit um, of moving from strength to strength, from Norm Augustine to uh, our uh, expert panelists here. Um, we have chosen them both for their expertise, but also for their um, different perspectives on this issue, which I think is one of the things we really wanted to get at with this event. So you have their bios. I'm just going to do very brief introductions of them and then turn the discussion over to them. That's who you want to hear from. Um, immediately to my left, um, we have Harvey Rishikoff, who is Director of Policy and Cybersecurity Research and Visiting Research Professor at the University of Maryland. Um, he has uh, vast experience both in public and private sector on uh, issues that are related to this topic of research collaboration um, and a challenge of U.S.-China uh, US competition. Uh, next to him is Dr. Richard Lester. He's the Associate Provost for International Activities at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I'm very thankful to have him here with us today. And then on the far right, your far right, we have Miko Husari. Um, who has, gets the prize for traveling the furthest to be with us today. He's from the Berlin-based Mercator Institute for China Studies, um, Merix. They've done an awful lot of excellent research on China-Europe relationship, um, including on foreign direct investment in Europe, um, and also on the topic of research collaboration from a European perspective. So um, I think you've all had plenty of background um, to kick off the discussion. I think what I'd like to do first is turn to Dr. Lester, if I may, and just hear um, your perspective coming from MIT and coming from a research and academic background, your take on the set of issues that are being discussed and how it looks from, from your perspective. Well, thank you, Stephanie, and, and thanks for the invitation to be here. I, let me just say uh, it's really a particular honor to be almost sharing the stage with Norm Augustine, who, whose contributions to science and engineering and whose service to the country I've admired for as, almost as long as I can remember. And uh, thank you for, uh, for all of that, Norm. I've actually been a member of the MIT faculty for 40 years. and. Um, one of the responsibilities of being a, a faculty member at a place like MIT is, um, is to know who around the world is doing the best work in your field. And if you ask the MIT faculty, as we did recently, uh, how they assess China's strength in their research areas, some would say that the Chinese are not competitive today and that that isn't likely to change. Some would say that the best Chinese labs will match MIT's in five to 10 years. And still others would say that the Chinese are already at our level. And obviously there are differences by field, but the general trend here is clear. So for example, today our faculty uh, at MIT are 10 times more likely to co-author uh, publications with colleagues from leading Chinese universities uh, than was true a decade ago. And it's a pretty safe assumption that those are real collaborations, that there's real exchange going on between the uh, co-authors. This is not a one-way street. I know my colleagues well enough to know that they wouldn't waste their time in that, kind, in that sort of co-publication activity unless there was real uh, uh, exchange going on. And I also think that almost every MIT faculty member uh, would say that uh, we should continue to bring China's best students and researchers here to the United States. They know uh, that MIT 
get stronger when we attract the world's most talented people to come uh, and work with us. And they also know that our country is stronger when we do that. Uh, so just as one indicator, at last year's NIPS um, AI conference, that's the top, uh, w the top AI conference um, uh, each year, 60% of the authors of the top papers at that conference, and there are 30 that are selected um, uh, for this honor, 60% uh, of the authors of those papers were working at American institutions. Uh, the next best represented country was Canada, which had, didn't you say you were from Canada? Originally, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they had 20% they had of, uh, of the top papers. But more than half of the people who had contributed the American papers, that is America's pool of top AI talent, came from somewhere else. And the country that sent us more of them than any other is China. There is a growing view uh, here in Washington and elsewhere, I think, across the country that these people are a threat to American security. And the door is starting to close. And I, uh, I want to say a few things about that. Um, let me make three points. The first point is that at MIT, we take very seriously the concern that uh, China has been trying to gain unduly from US university research. And as a consequence, we've enhanced our uh, internal review and risk assessment uh, process to try to ensure that our research collaborations don't threaten US national security or economic security. But, and this is the second point, at the same time, we believe that the US has benefited and continues to benefit immeasurably from its open research system, which has enabled US scientists to share their findings and attract the top students and, and researchers from around the world. And we also gain when our researchers can take advantage of other nations' expertise, including the growing scientific expertise of China. And when we also, when we have a window on the progress that the Chinese are making in key technologies. And the third point I want to make is that US law and US policy needs to strike the right balance between openness and protection. And among other things, what this means is to ensure that uh, uh, any requirement, any restriction that we, that we impose is well targeted and doesn't undermine the fundamental strengths of the US system. And in this regard, also Congress can help by ensuring that the US is investing sufficiently in our own R&D and also by making it easier and more desirable for those we educate to remain in the United States. So those are the three points. I'm just going to take, if I may, just a, a, a couple of minutes to elaborate on, on certain parts of this. First of all, with respect to our own internal process, recently, as I mentioned, we uh, introduced a new process to ensure that research that is supported by or conducted with uh, entities from China, from Saudi Arabia, and from Russia don't unduly harm US national security or economic security and do not contribute to repression uh, in those countries. Now, how do we decide what to do and what not to do? Well, there's no magic formula. Uh, uh, and what we've learned from doing these case-by-case -case reviews is that simple rules don't work and that you have to look very closely at the at each uh, project to look at the benefits that the project brings to us, to the uh, foreign collaborators, um, and also look very carefully at the risks. So for example, we stopped accepting funding, uh, new funding from Huawei a little over a year ago. Uh, we announced it publicly quite recently, and we've encouraged other universities to do the same thing uh, 
partly because of the risks posed by ongoing investigations by federal agencies associated with the sanctions violations. Uh, we're also increasing our efforts to enforce existing practices that, for example, describe what PhD, what PhD graduates can take with them when their studies are complete, uh, as well as what funding and collaborative relationships researchers uh, need to disclose. Um, we're also taking a closer look at when research in a given field might raise national security concerns. We don't, like, like many but not all uh, American research universities, we don't conduct uh, classified research on campus, but we do oversee Lincoln Lab, um, which does, of course, perform uh, classified research. Let me say a little bit more about the importance of openness. Uh, universities don't pursue open science merely because it's some sort of a charitable thing to do. Uh, universities conduct fundamental research openly uh, because it helps us, because it helps the world, because it is the way we can attract some of the top students from around the world. And I want to say here, because this has come up, I think it may come up in the discussion again, uh, we don't admit Chinese students or, for that matter, any other foreign students as a revenue source. Um, in fact, um, we, we, we lose money on foreign students, and that's why we can't take more. Uh, less than 2% of our undergraduates come from China. Um, because we admit uh, on a need-blind basis, and generally foreign students cost more to the institute than domestic students. So we have to, uh, we have to, we have to cap them. Um, okay, so finally on federal policy, um, uh, I would say just again that the government needs to have clear consistent and well-targeted policies for universities. It's very difficult for us when different agencies send different signals or if they have different lists of critical technologies or if they try to limit work on broad categories of research like artificial intelligence or like quantum, uh, quantum science or quantum engineering or if they create an atmosphere in which talented foreign students come to the conclusion that it's just not worth trying to come to the United States. Also, in talking to universities, some of our security agencies uh, don't distinguish between, on the one hand, concerns about illegal theft, and on the other hand, sharing openly published research. There is a difference, and it's important that that distinction um, is, is made. Um, there's been a lot of talk about limits on students, putting limits on students. Some have even suggested that we shouldn't accept any Chinese students uh, at American universities. But actually, if you look at the reports of breaches of national security uh, at universities, most of them have actually involved not students, but senior faculty. Uh, there aren't many that at least have been publicly uh, disclosed, but the ones that there are seem to uh, focus on uh, senior faculty. It's senior faculty that are most openly, most often targeted by foreign talent programs. And by the way, these aren't necessarily, uh, these faculty aren't necessarily foreign nationals or even ethnically connected to the nation that they're helping. So, so federal uh, policies should encourage universities to take reasonable steps uh, to manage risks on their campuses rather than imposing broad solutions that uh, may backfire. And then finally, uh, Congress needs also to think about how to strengthen uh, our own research and development system through targeted investment in uh, key areas of research. And to quote my my boss and friend, Raphael Reif, who's the president of MIT, he said recently, if all we do in response to China's ambition is to try to double lock all of our doors, I believe we will lock ourselves into mediocrity. <laughs>
So thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a, a theme emerging, I think, between our, our keynote and our first panelist. Um, I'd like to turn to Harvey and just um, going back to some of the initial comments on this topic of research collaboration and the potential problems and challenges to national security might pose, we know that this is not a new issue, right? We've got going back a few generations um, to the 1980s and this being kind of a, a, a component of the Cold War and worrying about leakage from the United States to the Soviet Union. Um, there was a commission convened, there were recommendations made, there was an executive order on how to treat that challenge. Um, there was another commission in the 90s where the focus had shifted to China as an area of concern, but really kind of came out in the same place, protecting open investment. But there is something that feels different about the current iteration of the discussion. Um, and so I'm hoping that you could, could maybe educate us and orient us a bit as to how this might be sure. a different challenge. Sure, first let me join Richard in saying it's wonderful to have Norm here, who's literally a legend, but we also should thank John Hamry, who's also been at the forefront and supporting you in order to do this program. And it's, uh, as always, a focus on something that's quite significant. So you notice that uh, the first point I'll make is that Richard has a slight accent because he's from England. I'm from Canada. That has always been the core of what makes America great, is the ability to attract individuals to want to come to this extraordinary experiment. So we always say the Canadians are to the Americans what the Greeks were to the Romans. To the Romans, we're here to help explain how to run an empire with classical values. Um, but it's always you know, a hard task. But that notion of a magnet is critical for what has made America great. So we're at a point when we say, are you a panda hugger or are you a dragon slayer? That's sort of the way the system has broken. And clearly what we're saying is that it's a much more nuanced issue and you need to have something which we, I would call a dragon tamer. And uh, there's someone in the audience here about a decade ago, uh, John McGaffin and I and a guy named uh, Bear Bryant wrote something called uh, the economic espionage uh, report for economic espionage in which we called for the first time out Russia, China, and Iran in a non-classified report. We were very clear that these individual countries were not following the rules of the game of a rule-based understanding that we had created, that they were using uh, espionage and stealing intellectual property, that there was what Norm said is if you break the rules, there must be consequences. There were no consequences during this period for these actions. So we, this, this debate has been starting about why is it different. I will tell you, from Canada, my uncle started trading with China in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. Because you remember during that period, Canada was allowed to trade with, quote, red China, and the United States was not. And the transformation, what Norman has said over the last 40 or 50 years, is extraordinary for where China is now, at, I would say, an inflection point. And Richard's position of, are they a peer competitor, rising to peer comp uh, competition, is clearly what we're confronting. And this is very different than the peer competition we had with Germany, and the fascist powers in the 30s and 40s. It's different than the peer competition we had with the Soviet Union. We are now entering into a peer competition. And the question is, what are the appropriate rules that our adversary will follow? The issue of the universities is only part of the issue. We've created a legal structure which includes CFIUS, FIRA, ITAR, export controls. We've created this regime. And the question is, is the regime sufficient to generate an appropriate legal and policy structure to engage the Chinese on, a evil, on, a, on an even playing field? I submit to you, that is unclear. They approach the world with a different operating system than we do. 
We deeply believe in our values of the First Amendment, our values of open competition, our values of an antitrust. That is not the adversary's understanding given their view of state-owned enterprises and the fact that their narrative arc is that at some point, if you look at their legislation, they argue that any entity should become an instrument of the state when it requires national security interests. Arguably, when someone said we can't go over too far in the national security balance on this issue, I will tell you that we're looking at things like the Defense Production Act, which gives the, the executive extraordinary power to illuminate a core issue that we see in this competition, and that is supply chain vulnerability. And that supply chain vulnerability for the de defense industrial base is a critical national interest. And what we can do to respond to the adversary, which includes, by the way, not just the Chinese, they're Russians, and we have their frenemies. The Israelis have been also found to do espionage in our core base. We have prosecuted them. We have to think through an appropriate policy legal structure and what I would say is that if we do not eliminate, uh, illuminate this core problem from the defense industrial base, which is this issue of distinguishing interesting research that's based on interest, research that's based on a general education versus purely applied, we have a series of institutions that Richard mentioned, which is our federally funded research development corporations, RAND, Lincoln Labs. We have a series of UARCs, university affiliated research corporations, that are targeted for particular scientific applied applications for our defense industrial base and defense platforms. That's where this national security issue rises and why there's such concern about these vulnerabilities. Now, I'll just end with it's why it's different is that when we thought, when we talk about the first offset inside DOD, that was the nuclear issue. The second offset was what we believe was the applied of technology in order for us to be, have advantage over adversaries harnessing technology, university breakthroughs and innovation. We are now, quote, what is the third offset, which is this new world of technology, which is much more diverse much more variated in what the issues are, whether it's from quantum to AI to machine learning, all of the things you just targeted as being things we should be interested in. You know, when we wear our other hat, that list, by the way, becomes the exact target list for intelligence agencies to try to penetrate to steal. So the moment you give out what you think is the core innovation, if you're dealing with an adversary who believes that, does not believe in intellectual property and the role of being able to gain comparative advantage by doing the stealing, you've given them a blueprint. That's the irony. So how we go forward is going to be this deep issue of which entity or institutions or system is going to have an appeal for values that will be attractive. And I'll end with, I was at Joe Nye last, a couple weeks ago, and he said, you know, when you look at the Chinese, they have a 1.4, 1.5 billion population that they're drawing on for this intellectual innovation. You, us in the West, we have a five or six or seven billion, dollar, billion population. As long as we remain appropriately open to attract those individuals to give us that comparative advantage for innovation, we will be in the end successful. If we fail, my offset is, which I encourage you all to do, is start taking Mandarin lessons. <laughs> I conclude with that. Uh, well, that, there's a lot to dig into there. We're saving a lot of time for questions. So um, your, your last comment, though, it's a good segue into our, our last panelist here um, in, in Miko. And I just want to preface my handing over to you with the way that we actually got to this topic um, was through foreign investments and reforms to foreign investment screening mechanisms, which is a project that we've been working on for the last 18 months. And the project is one that involved allies and partners of the United States.
because of the recognition that if the U.S. were to take action but act unilaterally and not in partnership with allies and partners, then there wouldn't be an effectiveness, desired effectiveness of that policy. So that's what actually started that conversation among some like-minded countries. It migrated over into export controls because of the way that that was dealt with in, in technology transfer and the way that was dealt with in the CFIUS reform. But then it's not too far of a jump then to if what you're really worried about is the technology and you're worried about kind of the foundational technologies, um, then you've got to actually start from the point of, of research and, and the basics here. And so if the principle kind of applies when you're talking about foreign investment screening and export controls that you need to work together with, um, with partners, then um, it may well hold for research as well. So that, that's the reason that we're so grateful that Miko could be with us today. And we're very curious to hear <laughs> how this issue looks from a European perspective. Um, so Miko, the floor is to you. Thank you, Stephanie. And um, I, I can only start by saying that it's, of course, a extreme honor to be on that panel here. Um, and I think um, from a European perspective, it's very important, not only for me personally, but I think more in general, that uh, we recognize the level of nuance and uh, eventual sophistication in this debate, because we tend to have increasingly a, quite a caricature of what the US debate on China is, and it's certainly not what we've had here on this panel today. So I think that's very educative uh, to a certain extent. Um, uh, again, also a, a high level of modesty on my side on, on this issue because I'm basically representing work that has been done at our institute on this issue, um, not by me personally. And uh, finally, talking about the European approach to research cooperation with China is, of course, as you all know, uh, difficult because we have 28 or 27 different approaches uh, to that issue. Uh, but still, I will try to, to provide you um, with three um, short insights into what I think is relevant here as a starting point. Um, I would like to start with an overview of what, what hap what's relevant, uh, what's happening in this space in EU-China relations. Uh, then look at, take the Germany example to talk a little bit about the depth and importance of that research partnership that we have with China. And then finally look at, uh, very briefly, the question to what extent there's a little bit of a rethinking of this issue uh, recently in the European space. Um, uh, on the first issue, what's the EU picture? Um, again, you know, this is, this is a remarkably important aspect of our relationship. Um, we have 40,000 student, Chinese students in Germany, the largest foreign student group, uh, students groups. Uh, same is true for the UK, 90,000 students. Uh, so just numbers, again, thousands of university partnerships in Germany alone, um, partnership agreements. Uh, we have hundreds of EU-funded projects, EU-funded projects that um, specifically target Chinese partners with quite sizable amount of uh, money. Um, so it, it's a, a sizable and growing aspect of our relationship with China. Uh, I would also like to highlight that it's a very dynamic um, and increasingly important aspect of government-to-government -government relations. Um, so in, in past years, uh, there's basically no European government that hasn't said that innovation and science and research cooperation shouldn't be a major part of our bilateral relationships with China. And um, we have very deep innovation partnerships for some countries, including Germany, again, the UK. Um, um, so I think there's probably 15 European countries that have interestingly following the US agreement on uh, a similar partnership with China, followed suit, followed the EU, and then concluded these agreements, which usually creates incentive systems for universities to actually engage more in these research and innovation partnerships. Um, so it's not only sizable and growing, it's, it's very dynamic also from a government to government perspective um, um, issue area. And I think what's important is to note that it's also a maturing um, aspect of our relationship. Um, if you look at one particular mechanism, how European countries fund research and research partnerships between the EU and China, the 2020, Horizon 2020 program, which is just a EU jargon for, for uh, research uh, funding, very sizable, um, hundreds, hundreds of uh, billions of euros flowing into that. Um, We've just shifted to a mode where China is co-financing. So until recently, it was basically Europeans funding research. And now this is formally 
much more in a mode where we consider China to be an equal partner in doing this. Um, uh, and I, I think we have to recognize also that the way how priority topics are being defined in this um, partnership is relatively smart and, uh, and, and um, looking at very important topics. So climate change is one of the key priority areas where we do joint research with Chinese. Uh, uh, agriculture, um, cancer, um, um, biotech. Um, so fields that are contested increasingly, also if we look at export control regimes in the United States, are priority areas for research in our relationship uh, with China. Um, now, uh, so it's a sizable, it's a dynamic, it's a very maturing uh, uh, field. The second point that I wanted to raise, and it's a bit um, anecdotal, I must say, but nevertheless maybe important, um, taking Germany as an ex example of the importance and depth of that uh, research partnership. I mean, if you look back over 100 years, uh, Germany f uh, founded and funded Tungji University um, as a institution that looks at medical research and then recently and moved into engineering. And one of the reasons for that was um, uh, that German companies needed engineers being trained in China. And this continues to be the case today. There's lots of technical universities who have partnerships with Chinese universities to do exactly that, to train engineers in China, uh, because German companies need good engineers in China. Um, so it's a very important aspect of our relationship going back hundreds of years, uh, uh, decades, basically. Um, uh, then if you look at individuals, uh, a former minister of science and technology, Wang Gang, uh, is a, an Audi engineer. Um, so he was trained at a German university and then spent a decade at a, a German car manufacturer and went back to CAS, Chinese Academy of Science, Tungji and other places, and ended up being the first non-CCP uh, minister um, conducting um, and being responsible for science and uh, research and now in the lead on everything that is related to e-mobility in China. Um, so I think this shows again the depth of the type of relationships that we have in that space with uh, China. Finally, institutions. Max Planck Institutes, for some of you, might be uh, something that you recognize as uh, the German way how we fund basic research, um, uh, prouds itself um, that 30% of the leading positions at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences have gone through Max Planck funding. Um, 10% of uh, Max Planck funded researchers currently in Germany are Chinese citizens. So um, institutionally, on the individual level, and then historically, it's a very deep relationship that we have with China in that space. Um, now, to what extent is there a rethinking currently? Um, it's a very new development. We have a trigger, which is Huawei. Um, so we have a little bit of a debate on this. We have two major European-funded projects that have Huawei as a partner. We have roughly 20 um, university partnerships, I think, that uh, um, have developed since 2006 uh, to a certain extent, sometimes more advanced, sometimes less, that work with Huawei. Uh, we have technical universities that now come to very different conclusions whether they should continue to do that or not. So it's, that's a current trigger for that uh, debate. But also, in a more uh, calm and sophisticated way, I would say, um, institutions in Germany and elsewhere are um, starting, you know, establishing task forces to look at this issue. And I think it's, it's good timing um, also for collaborating with uh, partners across the Atlantic to look at this issue in more detail. One specific aspect to just to mention here, um, um, there's an EU um, a grouping that will look at this issue going forward in the future. So I think there's quite some space to, to, to look at this in the, exactly the nuanced way as you have outlined uh, earlier. Thank you. Um, well, thanks. Thanks to all of you, actually, for those opening comments. We're going to save a lot of time for, for questions. I'm going I'm to pose a question, I guess, initially to, to Harvey, but I'm curious to hear what, um, what Miko and, and Dr. Lester have to say as well. But you, you'd suggested that there's, so there is evidence of, um, of bad conduct, <laughs> illegal conduct, on the part of China and other foreign entities um, when it comes to taking advantage and kind of violating the rules when it comes to research collaboration. And I think you could probably say that 
even beyond just research collaboration, that there's evidence of kind of violating the rules, and that what we actually need is kind of a reevaluation of the rules and maybe a fixing of the rules to accommodate this reality of the type of competition that we might be facing. What does that look like in the research collaboration space? What are the new rules that would be required that could allow us to kind of meet this challenge and at the same time not suffer the the implications of really building up a wall over the US kind of research and innovation base? So the first is objectively we know um, there has been an issue because we've had federal indictments of Huawei that are being prosecuted right now. And since we believe you're innocent until proven guilty, though a civil action, depending on the, the standard of proof, this is clear indication of evidence of violation of what we understand are the intellectual property laws and the laws of how we deal with the issue of um, collaboration. So the second issue is, I remember when I was at Harvard many years ago, there was a very interesting question about the use of MIT and Harvard scientists collaborating on applied research and who would own the intellectual property of that research. And there's always a fascinating incentive system for the faculty to be able to do that, making sure that the patents and intellectual property will be registered to those scientists and or the benefit to the universities so that they become a source of revenue and income. At the same time, you're incentivizing very bright faculty and very bright students to work on these fascinating questions. So a very rigorous regime that made that clear vis-a-vis -vis that ability to protect that intellectual property. Oh, and now the second question would be, the more you have collaboration with foreign scientists, would those be joint held patents whereby both the Chinese and American scientists would own it together and be able to be used by both entities and enterprises. That becomes quite a fascinating, interesting challenge, but that would at least establish what the rules of the world would be. And we've always said, as Richard was saying, this might be a maturity problem for the Chinese when they begin to understand of their investment for R&D and that they would not like to have their patents and IP stolen, they would begin to understand what a patent IP regime is. So it might be a maturity issue that we're looking at for them to understand the rules. But the interim period has been quite awkward vis-a-vis -vis an understanding of how they have been playing in the space. And the second part has been no real penalties for those actions. And third, we can't do this on our own. This clearly has to be an allied coordinated effort. So that's why we, there's been some, this, I would say, um, agitation or interest about how the Brits or the Germans are doing with Huawei and ZTE and how we are and what the possible consequences are. But that's what you start to want to have, a very robust legal regime. And I would end with the distinction is we don't have state-owned enterprises. China, France, to a certain extent, Israel have state-owned enterprises. That's a different understanding of a model and how the profits and how the interests are distributed are different. And we've always talked about WTO, about what that comparative advantage is. If you have SOEs, we don't. And that's an interesting question about should we be re-examining what our industrial policy is for us to protect certain core, what we think critical technologies are so that those are protected in a way for our national interest. It's got to be the topic of a, a future event, I think, <laughs> that, on, that on its own. I don't know. Uh, Dr. Lester, Amico, do you want to comment on that, that question of, of what kind of fundamental change to the rules or, or let, uh, let Harvey's answer stand? <laughs> Well, I, look, I think there have been, obviously, there have been cases in which the rules have been, our rules have been violated, and um, I think the solution to that is not to change the rules. I think it's to get them to comply with the rules that we have. And so, for example, um, you know, we've had this recent case of a violation of practice with respect to peer review. Um, and people engaged in 
peer review um, disclosing the information that they acquired in the course of the peer review to uh, folks back in China. I mean, that's a clear, we, we don't do that, and anyone who does that should be uh, uh, disciplined, and we don't have to change the rules. We should make sure that people understand that those rules exist, and if you violate them, uh, you, you've got a problem. So. Uh, yeah, that, that's actually a good segue into my, my last question, and then I'll hand it over to you guys. But, but what we have heard a lot of um, in the course of preparing for this event is the question of enforcement. So it's, it's along the lines of exactly what you said, that it's not so much a deficiency for what already exists, but it's the implementation. And so I'm, I'm curious, though, on the enforcement side, is it a question of raising awareness? Is it a question of resources on the part of the government articulating the concern? Or is it a question of resources at the universities to deal adequately with the, with the concern? Um, well, I, I, just to maybe start that off, I think it's a great question. I think it's all of the above. Mm. And uh, we, we certainly, on our campuses, I do think we have to do a better job uh, of uh, increasing the awareness of our community, our faculty, particularly our faculty, but also students and postdocs and others. We, we do have to do a, a better job uh, uh, of sensitizing people to um, what appropriate behavior is and, and what, isn't, uh, what isn't appropriate. But at the same time, I think there are also important things that our government needs to do. And we do have to recognize, and, and just to um, agree on this point with Harvey, I mean, this is a fundamentally asymmetric situation that we're in. The rules of the game in China are not the same as ours. I do think that over time there is more attention in China to the value of intellectual property and the importance of uh, having a, a workable IP regime. I think we, we see that. Uh, uh, people who study this more closely than I do report that um, IP is becoming more seriously uh, observed in China. I think that's natural as science and technology becomes a more and more important part of their economy. But still, there are some fundamental asymmetries uh, in the two economies. They don't have the same rules of the game that, that we do. And we have to be realistic about that and recognize uh, that when we're operating in China, it's not the kind of world that we, we operate in here. But I don't think that means that we should stop operating over there. I think it means that we have to go there with our eyes open and be realistic, but keep our eyes open because we need eyes on what the Chinese are doing in all of these areas of technology. And I think the universities actually have a very important role to play in providing a window on China that otherwise we probably won't have. Um, Miko, anything on the enforcement side? Well, I think it, um, you mentioned all the important uh, things uh, to start off, and uh, again, from a German perspective, um, I find it remarkable the level of um, exchanges on this issue is just really low uh, in science organizations. It's just a, it's a recent dialogue that we have, and um, uh, the, the linkages between what we do in the investment screening space, in the expert control space, and in the research collaboration space um, are not very well developed. Um, the system currently is very much based on self-policing of, ins uh, of research institutions, and that may work in some cases, and it doesn't in, in, in others. And I think there's quite some work maybe modeled on what Japan is doing in terms of the outreach and awareness raising that uh, German institutions, European institutions, government institutions can do there. Eventually, I think it really boils down to, to a, a, a much more assertive insistence on reciprocity also in research cooperation with the Chinese and, and, and a much more strategic um, approach to also what we want to get out of this partnership. Um, because as has just been mentioned, um, uh, it's very clear that research in China in many regards is, is much more strategic uh, mm -hmm. than we usually tend to think. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so at this point, <laughs> I see hands are already going up right now. Um, there's somebody with a mic that's traveling around. If you put your hand up, we can um, actually 
uh, where's my person with a mic that I can direct? Oh, sorry. How about right here in the second row? The gentleman put his hand up. If you could identify yourself um, and ask your question. Uh, thank you. I'm Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. I think I addressed this to Amico. Um, getting to the subject of Huawei, uh, there's some skepticism, and certainly from the Chinese side, about what's really behind the uh, troubles that Huawei is finding itself in. And the skepticism sort of expresses itself, and you see this here too, in the statement, uh, essentially, the whole world, uh, civilization, is moving on to the internet. So the issue is who's going to control the internet, and, eight, and um, 5G is going to be the gateway to the internet, and so forth and so on. So, um, if, from, from the standpoint of, of Germany, uh, are you going to be, uh, or not you personally, but Germany, are, uh, are you going to be forced to uh, choose who control, you know, who's, who you're going to let control the internet? Um, wh where, how are you going to sort this out? Well, that question, you really have to ask Washington whether we're going to be forced or not. Um, 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 but it's clear that it's an issue that has risen up the agenda quite dramatically and fast. Uh, and that's not only true for Germany, but also for the rest of Europe. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that Germany is not yet decided on this issue and would prefer a solution that is, um, again, nuanced and it doesn't involve an outright ban of Huawei. Um, um, and then trying to push this uh, towards a Brussels-based solution, meaning uh, seeking an alignment of EU countries on this issue um, for several reasons, because it makes sense from a commercial perspective that we have a united digital market, um, 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 but also uh, strategically it's, it's very unwise to, on this critical issue, be divided uh, uh, between a China-friendly and a US-friendly position. Um, so again, the short, short answer is, uh, I think Berlin doesn't know yet. Yep. Uh, there's a question right here, uh, three rows back, gentleman right on the aisle. Hi, my name's Lee Davis, I'm with Middleway Strategies. My question is really to the entire group. Uh, with the current president and his regime, um, do you see uh, things tightening between China and the U.S.? over the next four to six years vis-a-vis um, -vis technology and research? Um, I mean, I think it's a pretty obvious question, but I'd like you on the record for that. <laughs> okay, why don't you start? Why don't you uh, start? Yes, uh, but I think Matt Goodman just made a good point. Which president? Um, um, uh, yes. Um, no, clearly. Uh, clearly, clearly from both. I think it's, it's clear from both sides that we will see a tightening of, of this relationship. Um, uh, it's just a question of how far this is going. Well, I, I, uh, yes, we'll see a, a tightening, but I don't think, and others are probably much more capable of commenting on this than I am, but I, you know, I don't think this is purely, or maybe not even primarily, the consequence of our current President, I think this is uh, something much more fundamental about the relationship between China and the U.S. And it is obviously, as a number of people have pointed out, one of the few more or less bipartisan issues um, in, here in Washington. And certainly when I do the rounds here um, and, and talk to colleagues on Capitol Hill about this issue, um, I don't necessarily know whether I'm talking to a Democrat or a Republican. I mean, they're uh, both saying rather similar things. So yeah, it's going to get tighter. It's going to, from the point of view of, of universities like mine, I think I would use a somewhat more judgmental word. It's going to get worse before, before it gets better. Uh, and we're going to have to live with that. So I've worked for three presidents. And each one of the times I've worked in each of those three administrations, we all identified this issue of the technology problem as being a core, fundamental, existential problem going forward. On your 5G issue, we're not, if we do not have a technical way of understanding transparency, for the upgrades 
of these particular networks and systems, we are at a world of hurt. So all of you have your phones, and all of you, I'm sure, do your upgrades when you're told to do them. When you do that, you're giving your entity up to a third party you know nothing about, and you trust them for this alleged upgrade. That's our concern going down. And we may have a world, if we can't resolve it, of there will be a Chinese form of networks and a Western, Nokia, Ericsson form of networks. That would be bad. That's not what was envisioned as to how we would go forward. But that is a clear possible future if we cannot resolve this issue and Europe, Latin America, and Africa cannot figure out where to go with us saying, we won't be able to use you as a reliable, trusted network because of our concern and fear next year, three years, four years from now, some update going on that compromises that whole network. So th this president is, is identified the issue in a way that previous presidents tiptoed up to but did not confront. But when you talk to professionals, we've been concerned about this now under three different administrations of our concern of what the potential vulnerabilities are in the system. And I think you know we have to be a little bit more um, optimistic. We have demonstrated an extraordinary ability to survive and adapt in this experiment over the last 250 years. And in the end, the Chinese need the market. If they do not continue to grow at the rate they need to grow, they grow, as he said, a 350 million you know, middle class. They increase their middle class by the size of Canada every year. And if they cannot continue that economic distribution, they are very concerned about their stability and order. So as we say, there's a few more acts in the play before we know what the consequences are going to be. Yeah, but to get kind of underscore this point, and one of the things that we and discovered, not that it wasn't already known, but it wasn't known to us, and I don't think it's widely known, that people do tend to think of this as a tension that is really manifest now because of, of President Trump and, and President Xi, kind of that combination. The thing that we learned, I would say the agency that's probably furthest along in thinking about this issue is Department of Energy because of its oversight responsibility for the national labs, and that these concerns have been there predating this administration. Um, yes. And so it's clearly not just an issue that's unique to kind of the two leaders that are there. Um, the, the approach is certainly one, and, and it gets to, I think, also kind of the question of whether or not this idea of decoupling, which is floating around and I think is unique to this administration, if that's even kind of a feasible outcome in research or just economics more generally. Um, okay, next question. Uh, there's a woman in the second row here in white. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Yang Yang Cheng, I'm a physicist actually, um, in one of the curiosity-driven fields. Um, so I have a question uh, touching up on one point that Professor Lester mentioned earlier with MIT's policy in terms of evaluating on the case-by-case -case basis of um, not harming national security and not um, contributing to repression in respective countries. And so I would like to uh, come to the second point. In the particular um, example is um, MIT CCL has a collaboration with the Chinese air company iFlatech that uh, collaborates with the Chinese government in terms of building this nationwide voice-based surveillance system as well as uh, the surveillance state in the northwestern region of Xinjiang. And so um, broadly for both the US government as well as like, uh, the, the German institutions, the government level and the university level, what should be the appropriate policy in terms of collaborating with Chinese uh, companies or receiving financial support from Chinese companies that work towards not necessarily external defense but internal oppression within China itself, considering that human rights is a matter of national interest for the US and probably for Germany as well. Thank you. So I think this is a really hard question um, about two months ago we um, like well let me just say about two months ago we, we convened a, a conference at MIT to try to learn more about the 
uh, actions of the Chinese government in Xinjiang and uh, in particular the role that uh, technologies of uh, facial recognition, voice recognition, DNA screening um, are playing in support of what the Chinese government uh, is reportedly doing and we learned a lot from that uh, conference and one of the reasons that, that we felt it was important to have that conference um, uh, was that until fairly recently this has not been very widely reported uh, and not, not very well known. So I think we're learning uh, more about this. I think we're going to have to look at our uh, relationships. Um, and it's not, I would say, primarily because our government is telling us to, um, although certainly there are some voices in the government that are obviously raising this. But I would say more than anything, it's because our faculty is concerned about um, uh, what may be happening and whether we can assure in a reasonable way, plausible way, can we really assure, ensure ourselves and others that when we collaborate with Chinese companies, what we're doing will not find its way into the kind of uses that will be counted to our values as an intellectual and an academic community. So we have to ask ourselves these questions. They're very, they're very hard questions because it's not always easy, as you will know perhaps as a physicist, it's not always easy to trace a path from uh, a, pe a piece of fundamental research uh, to a particular application. And we have to try to do that as, p as part of our uh, assessment process. So I would recommend the University of Toronto. And I recommend the Monk Institute. They were the first that did the ghost net study almost a decade ago, in which they are particularly having a university entity focused on the use of technologies that are used by authoritarian regimes to repress dissent. That's what universities can do. But I'd be careful about the money issue because, you know, I'm a graduate of McGill, and we say McGill was raised and funded by the three great vices, uh, Seagram's Liquor, Red Pass Sugar, and Red Nose Tobacco, which now are considered deadly things, but they rose and support a great university. So it's a very interesting issue which people are going through about receiving funding as long as that funding comes with no particular influence for what the research would be. And then I said this upstairs, I'm a former dean and a, a former member of the IC and the law enforcement, and I say, we say, based on my experience, the difference between tenured faculty and a terrorist is you can negotiate with a terrorist. <laughs> so tenured faculty come to their job with a particular sense of their own independence about what they want to do, visa what kind of research they want to do, and who will fund them. All right, do we have a question over here? Uh, there's a woman on the far side over here, about three rows back. Yep. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Alola De Fatumbi. I'm a Chipoya Science and Technology Policy Fellow. Um, I work in the Office of Japanese Affairs at the Department of State. So one of the most interesting things about our talk today is to talk about what has changed. And if you look at different reports done by the NCSES, NCSES, you see that most of the students who receive their PhDs in science and technology from the United States have international baccalaureate origins, right? And roughly around 36%. And this means that you know we're largely dependent on recruiting and retaining talent from international organizations. I think one thing we haven't really discussed is how a lot of countries now are in a position to provide incentives for these students who come from other countries to go back to their country and have really great research experiences and have really great labs. How do we compete with that? Because those are different things that have changed that are not illegal. 
So my question is moving forward, how do we compete with different things changing in the um, science and technology landscape that is not illegal, such as China saying, oh, if you go and learn in, um, at Stanford and you come back to our country, we'll give you $500,000 in startup money. So those are one of my questions, and how do we make ensure that we create an environment where we're teaching people to be more, have morals and have our same values, but we're ensuring we're not being racist or xenophobic? Because if we're carrying out this message, we have to be stern, but we have to also understand how we can not create an environment where these students, which are mostly international, want to leave this country. Well, um I, I guess I'd just say two things. One, it's, it's hard to think of a more important issue than the one that you've just raised. Um, if we are not able to continue to attract the very best people from around the world, we're in big trouble. I mean, really big trouble. And so, uh, so I think this is a really, really absolutely central issue. And the other thing I would say is, why do people want to come here? Why do people want to come to the United States? To st why do the best people want to come to our universities to study? It's because they know that uh, it will be a very stimulating environment. And they, maybe they don't know all the details of what that means, but I think they sense that what they will get here in our university environment is the freedom to pursue what they're interested in and not be interfered with in the way that they might be if they, are in, uh, if they stay home, including, by the way, in China, where, as we know, the environment in many, probably all universities, is becoming more and more restrictive. So I, I think we, we must find a way to maintain the openness, the intellectual excitement, um, and, and the values of our, of our university campuses. And I think we have to be very careful to avoid restrictions, well-meant restrictions, that may actually backfire and produce almost exactly the opposite results uh, of those that are, that are trying to implement them. So I, I, there's people old enough in the audience. I was in university during the um, tail end and the beginning of the tail end of the Vietnam War. And we had extraordinary number of Americans, South Asians. Europeans preferred to go to Canada during that period rather than come to the United States because of their criticism of the American foreign policy in South Asia. And I would say that the other issue to look up what Norm had said, we have a huge dearth of talent coming in to the NSA Cyber Command. There's a huge need, both in the government sector and the public sector, for talented, cyber-related, innovative young men and women. And we should have a real, what we believe, cyber core, where young universities are able to start to give clearances to these young people and bring them into the jobs and places where they could do the potential classified work and or are able to start to be educated in where the space is going. So I was recently at CMU, uh, Carnegie Mellon. They actually have a master's degree in what they call risk management. They are changed, that's the field we're looking for, what we call the geek wonk bridge. So individuals understand policy and understand technology. And we need to help educate the next generation for that to help provide the jobs for both the United States and in the West because of the huge demand going on. And how we are able to have a president, when you ask that question, the last president I remember talking about a science challenge was Kennedy. And that was the, the going to the moon. That was the famous moonshot. Well, we need our leadership to challenge our next generation to do this and support it. Uh, we always say we're always four years away from having extraordinary talent in almost any language you want if the government supports that language training. And 
the look at the people coming out of MIT or uh, the, the, the one data point I have, I think Maryland has more computer scientists that are studying computer science than there are MIT students on an undergraduate level. We have huge capacity to generate huge amounts of talent. It has to be supported and exploited by us. So I think we've got about five minutes left. And um, what I'd like to do, I think we have time for maybe three more questions if we could group them um, and then pass them to the panelists. Um, there is a question here. There's a gentleman four rows back with his hand up in a plaid shirt. Yep. I think you're the panelists. Very great talk. Um, I have a question actually about, do you think the policymakers either here in the United States and over in Europe are sufficiently tech literate enough right now to decide the kind of policies we should be pursuing? Either, we're either you're talking about decoupling or not decoupling. Um, and, and a second very short one, are international forums and platforms that moderateralize these kind of discussions still important to the United States in an era when we're talking about this is what we have decided to do, you know, enforcement, and we are pushing our allies to enforce it as well. Are these forums still important um, instruments to pursue? Okay, so we'll hold that question. Uh, Nelson, there's a one, two, three rows back. Uh, gentleman with the blue tie. Uh, Nelson Cunningham, McClarty Associates. I, I, this is just a fascinating, fascinating session. Thank you, CSIS, for putting this together. Uh, and it's good to see you again, Dr. Lester. My question is this. You all are obviously grappling with what you understand is an incredibly serious issue. Is there adequate, do you get adequate guidance from the federal government here in terms of where the risks are, who the risks are, what the real concerns are? And can we contrast what's happening in Germany and the EU? Do you get better guidance? Is there more effective collaboration on these issues between those in the security structure and those in academia who are trying very hard not to do the wrong thing here? OK, and let's take one question from here. There's a woman in the way back. Hi, Tina with Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Um, so about a week and a half ago, Emory University terminated a professor who failed to disclose ties to China, um, to NIH, and he was abruptly termi terminated. He's a Chinese American citizen, and most of his lab were Chinese national PhD students. Um, they were told they had 30 days to leave the US. Um, and I think that Emory's situation is one of many that are to come, because NIH and FBI are now investigating 55 universities for similar allegations. Um, and it's rumored that this professor is going to go back to China and likely start a lab there and bring um, his PhD students with him. And so my question is, was this response too severe um, from Emory? Is this going to instigate another brain drain? And if this was too severe, what would your uh, recommendations be for an appropriate course of action moving forward? OK. Three excellent questions to end our, our panel. Um, why don't we go first? There was the question about kind of the multilateralization of the decision making, if I've got that right. So uh, maybe I can talk about tech literacy because uh, I mean I can't do any better than than Norm Augustine did on that on that subject. But I will say something that maybe you don't expect me to say, which is that just as it's important for our legislators and, and uh, executive branch people to be literate technically, I think it's becoming increasingly important for our engineers and scientists to have an appreciation of the, uh, let's call it humanistic and as well as economic and public policy aspects of what they're doing. So I think there's work to be done on, on, on both sides. Um, on, on the issue of Nelson, on the issue of guidance from, from government, I, we can always complain, and we do complain. Um, we complain a lot. Uh, but, but I think what, what I would hope for more than guidance is the opportunity to, uh, for the university community, the academic community, to engage in conversation with the decision makers in the various agencies um, and on, on Capitol Hill. And I think there was a period where not a lot of that was happening uh, on the issues that we've been talking about this afternoon. 
but I do feel as though uh, doors are open now in a way that I would have said two years ago, perhaps not so much. So I'm actually feeling more uh, positive. I can't compare our situation with uh, the one in, in Europe, in Germany, or elsewhere. But I feel as though we can't solve these problems without real dialogue between the academic community and the policy-making community. And I think there's m more now um, of that than even just a, a couple of years ago. So I thank you for the question. Um, uh, I, I, I'm perhaps more positive than you, you, you might, have, might have expected. And then on the Emory issue, I, I don't know enough about that situation, I'm afraid, to, uh, to be able to uh, comment on the pros and cons of, of, of what was done. Um, on the more general issue of NIH requirements, um, uh, the NIH, as probably m most of us know, has been in the lead on requiring uh, academics to disclose uh, other research relationships and funding relationships. I would only ask, and I don't know whether there's anyone from the NIH here uh, uh, to respond on this, but I would only ask that when those requests are made by agencies of government for information from academics, it is made clear how the information will be used, what will be done with it and what won't be done with it. Because sometimes we've seen requests for information come from government agencies without explanation as to what will be done with it. And I can tell you that it makes people in uh, uh, the university community pretty nervous. And it's not productive. So I hope that uh, when these requests for information come, there will be a little bit more clarity about what will be done with it. Any other comments, panelists? Um, I would say that one of the sad things that's happened recently is we disbanded Jason. And I think that was an extraordinary tool and that we have things like the Defense Science Board and we have the, who have come in forward with reports that are clearly quite instructive and insightful about the problem set. And we need to have Congress fully understand them and take them up and that congressional leadership. Um, on the issue of the federal government, um, again, we have, you know, when Eisenhower wrote his final speech and talked to the, mil the military industrial complex, I don't know if originally in the original speech it said military industrial congressional complex. Yeah and that Eisenhower erased the, struck out the congressional because he said that there was two guys coming in, the president and vice president had just come from the Senate, a guy named Kennedy and Johnson, and he didn't want to insult them about where they had come from. But that is a core issue about how that entity can respond both positively and negatively. And finally on the Emory, it always has to be an issue of what the appropriate due process is. What makes us distinctive is that there are allegations made, but what is the level of evidence? What is the due process? What is the ability for someone accused to come forward and defend themselves? That's the essence of who we are. And if we overdetermine and lose that, then we are going down a path that will not be attractive for people to come to MIT and leave Europe in order for them to study with us. Miko, any final words? Very brief comment, really. Um, usually the level of guidance that we have on this issue is from, from the German government or from Brussels would be on the level of there is a document somewhere that you can look at. And, um, so, um, <laughs> and um, which is probably not enough. I think uh, the broader point here is that we, we lack an understanding in Europe um, and institutions that would look at issues such as supply chain security, the long-term industrial base of Europe, and the way how this interlinked with government action and research um, institutions working on these issues. And that's certainly a field where working with partners and allies will, will be important going forward too. Great. Well, I, I have to say one of, one of the goals of this discussion was to actually 
connect some of the dots between folks that are seeing and concerned about the national security side of things, but then also very cognizant of the trade-offs when it comes to research and innovation. And I think the three of you are actually great examples of people that have expertise that can kind of build those bridges. So um, please join me in thanking Mr. Augustine for his talk and for our panelists.